Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Brian Motherway, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of all of us here at the International Energy Agency. Today's webinar is on a really important topic around the social impacts of clean energy policy, something that's really vital at the heart of why we are engaged in this business of clean energy transitions in order to make people's lives better, to improve health and well-being, productivity, uh, to give people greater access to clean energy, and of course, to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. There's a lot of really interesting work going on on this topic, and we're going to hear from some of the world's leading experts on this. So I want to thank all of the experts and panelists who have been kind enough to join us today. And I particularly want to thank the IEA Experts Group on R&D Priority Setting and Evaluation, uh, who have collaborated with us to put this event together, bringing together such excellent participants. And in particular, I want to thank Berta Hulse Jorgensen, who has been central to the design and development of today's event, and I'm very pleased she's with us now. So Berta, thank you very much for all of your collaboration, and please let me hand the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and also uh, welcome to the webinar or workshop uh, from the EGRD. Uh, I think we have a very exciting program in front of us on social impacts of clean energy policies. Uh, I have the pleasure to chair the EGRD together with Atushi Kurosawa and Johannes Tamburini. Uh, and I just want to give you a few words about uh, EGRD. It's an informal expert group that for more than 25 years have advised the IEA Committee on Energy Research and Technology, the CERT, on topics important to accelerate the energy transition. This urgent need is our mission, it's our why. And in practice, what we do, and what we also do at today's workshop is that we examine analytical approaches to energy technologies, policy and R&D, and we promote dialogue and information exchange on methodologies and approaches related to technology assessment, priority setting and evaluation. And how do we do it? We organize expert workshops where we invite practitioners and researchers to exchange and discuss topics of relevance to the energy transition. And these findings are then communicated to the search and to interested stakeholders. Previous workshops have, for example, focused on behavioral aspects in reaching net zero emission by 2050, circularity and sustainability of new energy technologies, and impact assessment of energy innovation policies. We produce a very brief a summary report and post it on the technology cooperation program for end users on their web page. And this webinar will also be uh, summarized and made public available. So with these words, uh, back to you, Brian. Thank you very much, Berta. And again, thanks to you and all of the expert group for the collaboration on all of the topics we work together. But of course, I'm particularly excited by today's topic around the social impacts of clean energy transitions. And before we proceed, let me just say a few words about the context of this work, particularly in the work of the International Energy Agency, under a wider set of activities that we call people-centered clean energy transitions. And we use this term to signify that we have to remember that people are at the center of all clean energy transitions. So the work we do on energy and climate policies and on clean energy is about people and it's for people. It's about making their, their lives better, enhancing their access to energy, enhancing the well-being that energy brings them, but also in ways that, that, that consults with people, that involves people, that meets their needs, and of course is acceptable to people. And questions around political participation, political acceptance and engagement are key to clean energy debates all across the world. So when we frame what we mean by people's and clean energy transitions, we use the work of the Global Commission on People's Centered Clean Energy Transitions <laughs> that we convened a couple of years ago to, to bring together ministers, union leaders, civil society representatives to really look at what do we mean by a term like people-centered clean energy transitions. And the members of the commission under the able leadership of the prime minister of Denmark and chaired by the energy minister of Denmark, Jan, Dan Jorgensen, brought together a concept of people-centered clean energy transitions that I certainly find very useful in our work here, looking at four major themes. First of all, 
decent, decent jobs and worker protection that looks about maximizing the benefit of decent jobs, protecting people that might be affected, affected negatively, negatively by transitions, but also looking at questions, skills, training, uh, participation and dialogue. A second theme of social and economic development, again, remembering that that all policies around clean energy are meant to enhance social and economic development, enhance energy access, eliminate fuel poverty, make people's lives better, make energy more secure, more affordable, and make energy systems more resilient. And of course, that's been a major question for all of us in the last year in particular. The third team is equity and social inclusion and fairness, looking at making sure that, that all clean energy po policies are properly proofed in terms of that they, they benefit uh, populations equally, that we make sure that more vulnerable or marginalized populations are properly looked after, that no sector of society is risking disproportionate negative impacts. And of course, a particular focus here on indigenous communities, on gender equality and social inclusion, and of course, in incorporating the voices of youth in all decision-making. And that brings me to the fourth theme around people as active participants, thinking about the role of behaviour change and how we encourage behaviour change, how we facilitate people to be part of clean energy transitions, how we facilitate the uh, proper democratic debates, uh, participation, engagement, and of course, exchange of information among governments and institutions at the same time as well. Excuse me. So, we have been working more and more on this topic with our governments around the world, with the members of the IEA and beyond, and you'll find a lot of information on our website around analysis of jobs associated with clean energy, around questions of skills, around some of the just transition questions that many governments are facing right now. And I would encourage you to have a look at that materials. And of course, we'd love to hear from you about how our work can dovetail with your work. Uh, let us know what work is going on, how we can collaborate further. Today is very much a step in our communication journey in terms of reaching out to many of the experts you're going to hear from shortly, many of the experts joining us online so that we can enhance this work and ultimately we can help all governments uh, use better knowledge and data to make better policies uh, in this sphere. So before I close, let me just say that this convening element is really important. We're growing it in a number of ways. Today's webinar falls into a series of webinars we have been holding. You can find out more information uh, on our website about all of these events that we are holding, and, and we're very keen to hear from you about these. We're also bringing together union leaders, other platforms uh, to enhance the, so the dialogue societally and across the world on these questions. This is in recognition of, of government's really strong focus on, on the people dimensions of clean energy transitions, realizing that policies need to be focused on how they can enhance people's lives, uh, how they can learn from experience of others to do so properly, how they can have a strong uh, real ethic of, of equity, inclusion, and social and economic benefit. So today is a step on that journey because of course we need to measure, we need to understand what has happened and what has been achieved already. We need to understand what kind of research is going on around the social impacts of clean energy policies, what we have learned from policies that exist already, what we have learned from research that has been undertaken on those policies, and how we can bring that together to advise governments uh, for their next policy decisions and their next steps. So I'm really delighted at the set of experts we brought together today. I want to thank them again uh, for coming and joining us to share their knowledge and expertise uh, and to, to guide that discussion and to uh, introduce all of our speakers and to facilitate some uh, discussion among them. I'm going to hand you over to my colleague. Divya Reddy, uh, my colleague here in the IEA, who's going to lead our webinar for the rest of the sessions of afternoon. Divya, please. Uh, thanks, Brian, and uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon to, to everyone participating. Um, so as, as Brian mentioned, now we're going to move to our, our main presentations for today's workshop. And for that, we're very pleased to have um, an excellent lineup of experts who have all been doing research into various angles that, that assess the socioeconomic implications of clean energy policies. Um, and as Brian mentioned, we really do need to get a better understanding of what research is currently out there, what it shows, and how to improve our understanding of the, the impacts and also the interplays of various issues to support clean energy policies that can really have optimal outcomes for, for all members of, of society. 
So after the presentations, we will have time for some Q&A and discussion. So I'd ask all our participants to please submit questions as they arise through the chat function in Zoom. And we'll try to address as, as many of them as possible um, at the end. So with that, without further ado, I'll turn to our first speaker um, who will set the scene for us in terms of understanding the social impacts of energy policies. So for that, we have Angela Ficciariello. I apologize for the pronunciation. Um, she's a senior researcher at the International Institute for Sustainable uh, Development's Energy Program. She's previously worked as a policy analyst and researcher at the UK's Office of Gas and Electricity Markets at Oxfam and at the Overseas Development Institute. Her research at IISD focuses on is issues such as the economic implications of fossil, fossil fuel supply under net zero emission scenarios, uh, public finance for fossil fuels, and energy transition opportunities for national oil companies. For today's discussion, Angela will um, speak to us about very interesting research she's done through a policy tracker of energy policies around the world following the COVID-19 pandemic and their correlation to, to socioeconomic outcomes, in particular uh, poverty and inequality. So Angela, over to you to, for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian, for the introduction. And hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the idea for inviting me. It's uh, really a pleasure to be at such uh, an interesting and relevant event. And um, yeah, so what I'd like to uh, present in this short presentation is some of the findings from our last year's report uh, called In Search of a Triple Win. As the title suggests already, what we were trying to do through this work was understanding what energy policies can bring us a triple win, basically, on the three fronts of climate, poverty, and inequality. And if we can move to the next slide, please. So the way we did that was to create what we call the um, energy, po um, energy policy tracker inequality and poverty dashboard. I'm sorry, it's a really long word, where our key question was basically, what are the likely social impacts of certain energy policies? And we used as a starting point uh, our energy policy tracker, which is a database that IISD, together with partners, created during the COVID-19 pandemic to track um, energy policies put in place by over 30 governments uh, during the pandemic period, uh, in the period between January 2020 and November 2021. Uh, policies were categorized in the tracker according to their climate impact, so basically clean versus fossil policies, and uh, over 1,000 policies were um, tracked during that period. Uh, what we did for the inner inequality and poverty work was to take these policies and regroup them, uh, this time uh, into new categories that were relevant from a poverty and inequality perspective rather than a climate perspective. And so we uh, based our assessment on uh, thorough literature review. We got uh, 32 categories in the end, which were uh, something like the ones you see here, government support for EV charging infrastructure, for example, or uh, support for energy efficiency and retrofitting in social housing. And the idea is that while this work was done uh, using the energy policy tracker as a test bed, so basically looking at policies approved during the pandemic, it's not limited to uh, recovery type of policies because a lot of the policies that were approved during, during the pandemic were actually energy policies that governments approve as business as usual as well. Um, what was not in the scope of the dashboard was a detailed assessment of uh, specific policies. So we rather looked at policy categories rather than uh, the specific policies per se. And we didn't carry out a thorough analysis of uh, factors such as gender and race and their interactions with energy policies, which is really relevant to this conversation, but we basically focused on socioeconomic uh, impacts of energy policies. And um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, some of the key findings from this work were that uh, while governments have uh, quite a clear idea of what policies to implement to reduce carbon emissions, they don't really have 
uh, great ideas of how to do so by tackling also poverty and inequality at the same time. And um, poverty and inequality effects uh, of energy policies tend to be assessed often on a short term basis, but that's usually not enough because over the short, medium and long terms tend to vary over time. And so we need to look at these dimensions altogether. Um, and finally, I think this is the key finding, really, I will go more into this in the course of the presentation, is that uh, the context in which policies are approved and the nuances of the policies themselves are really key to designing socially progressive policies. The idea here is that uh, similar type of policies can be implemented in completely different contexts and bring completely different impacts as well as the policy design elements themselves and any broader complementary policies that you can implement do matter a lot in terms of social outcomes. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, this is uh, just to give you an example of what kind of uh, policy summary assessments we produced. So for example, you see for the first category, uh, it's government support for the purchase of households uh, renewable energy installation. And when we look at uh, what the literature says about the expected impacts on poverty and inequality, we see that this type of policies can actually both increase poverty or decrease poverty, depending on whether we are looking at a fully electrified high income country in which usually residential uh, renewable installations tend to increase the electricity tariffs that is paid by the lower income consumers, or can actually decrease poverty in uh, the context of lower income countries where potentially these measures are targeted at non-electrified rural areas and these policies have the effect of uh, increasing uh, access to energy, decreasing the cost for access and providing generally economic opportunities. Uh, same idea when you look at impacts of this type of policies on inequality, you see that in high income countries context, these tend to benefit mostly higher income households that can actually afford to uh, have uh, this installation and to pay for the upfront costs. When you look at lower income countries, potentially this can benefit lower income parts of the population, hence decrease inequality. I won't go into the details of this. I'm happy to take more questions during the discussion, but if we go to the next slide, Basically, the idea for showing this was that you can produce a summary assessment of policies. We did that in our work. But then what you realize is that a lot of the uh, assessments do depend on the contextual factors uh, that you have to take into account. And here we thought it's useful uh, to actually collect all the contextual factors that are key to understanding social outcomes of energy policies. So we did so by sectors, because these are the sectors that the energy policy tracker had organized the policies in. Uh, but you know, as a matter of, of example, you can see that under the mobility sector, we looked at policies such as support for public transport. And those, the impacts that those have from a social perspective tend to depend on factors like, uh, you know, the demographics of the ridership, the size and the density of the metropolitan areas and the location of the uh, key public services that are accessible by public transport, the availability of alternative transport options for the low income communities, but also the, you know, makeup of the car owners or the car ownership rates in a country, uh, the size of the car industry, for example, and the type of makeup of workers that this industry provides jobs to. And similarly, if you look at the building sector, for example, that is where, uh, you know, most energy efficiency retrofitting uh, policies come uh, under, you will see that in this case, uh, social impacts do depend a lot on factors like the income level of the households that can access subsidies for energy efficiency retrofits, any changes in energy costs that is either related to the retrofits or not, uh, the levels of uh, energy poverty, especially of the population living in the uh, social housing stock, uh, the quality from an energy performance perspective of the housing stock itself, uh, and so on. Uh, and finally, we looked at factors that are 
common to many different sectors, meaning most of the policies, the energy policies actually are affected in their outcomes, in their social outcomes by these factors. Um, these are the ones at the bottom. You see stuff like, you know, the national income distribution in a country, the share of the urban population versus the rural population and the extent of rural and urban poverty that you have, the type of tariff structure that you have in a country when it comes to gas, electricity, again, public transport fares, um, but also stuff like, you know, the average household spending, energy spending, to, um, to say another one. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. So yeah, the last um, element I wanted to delve into is the idea that beyond context, there are elements that are uh, part of the policy design itself and that do matter a lot uh, when it comes to what outcomes uh, an energy policy can have in terms of poverty and inequality. Um, and these are what we call policy design elements. They are the ones on the left-hand side of the, the table. Uh, so we identified among those mostly uh, the targeting of incentives for low-income groups. This includes cash transfer and loans, the idea of subjecting uh, incentive subsidies, rebates to income tiers or having income caps for them, uh, special targeting with, you know, potential priority for interventions in rural areas, the conditionality of government support to uh, obligations on companies to provide consumer support for low-income groups and job retention, um, the progressive and phased implementation of policies over time is something that tends to be very progressive and help with the outcomes. Uh, and um, crucially, the inclusion of uh, those groups that are economically vulnerable, such as uh, local and indigenous communities in the decision making process, for example, through consultation. Um, and finally, you see on the right hand side of the table that there are policies that are not necessarily part of the policy design itself, but they are complementary, they are additional policies that can be put in place to either uh, enhance the positive social outcomes that you would already have from a policy or mitigate the negative social outcomes. I'll mention a few, you know, we have uh, job training and retraining for workers that are affected by transitions. Uh, we have the idea of revenue recycling, for example, for uh, fuel taxes to uh, programs that can explicitly target uh, low income groups. We have the general progressivity of the uh, taxation system, which matters a lot also to, to energy policy outcomes. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, yeah this is my last one. I would like to summarize a bit uh, what said so far and uh, provide a few recommendations. So um, what our study showed us very clear was that uh, the assessment of social outcomes of energy policies is extremely complex and context dependent. A lot of the policy categories that we looked at had an assessment which was either unclear or mixed. But nevertheless, there are a few clear conclusions there. Some of the policy categories were clearly what we call lose-lose policies. So it's policies where both the environment and society loses out. Those were mostly in the fossil fuel extraction um, area. And on the other hand, there are policies that we call win-win ones. So where both the environment and society wins, for example, uh, retrofits and then energy efficiency support in uh, social housing stocks. And government, of course, have to remove support for the former and scale up support for the latter. And more generally, when it comes to clean energy policies, they tend to have mixed effects on social outcomes, but they can all be designed in ways that mitigate their potential detrimental effects. And this should be the final end, the final uh, objectives to, to reach. Um, from a um, research analysis perspective, I think it's really key to uh, carry out more systematic assessments of the social and climate impacts of energy policies and to do so looking not only at the short term impacts, which we tend to have more information about, but also the long term ones, which we have really little about. And with that, 
uh, case studies of you know national regional applications of policies can definitely support something else that can help a lot and we're getting more of that now is so-called ex post assessments that can support the ex-ante ones so seeing how a policy effectively fared afterwards you know after some time and monitoring these effects after uh, after some time that would be really helpful and I think I'll stop there. Uh, and thanks everybody for your attention. Looking forward to the questions and discussion. Okay, so um, thanks very much, Angela. And it's both interesting and, and very useful to see the various types of policy design features and sort of understand their impacts, in particular on poverty and inequality, as well as the different contextual elements that, that can materially impact the outcome. So I'm sure we'll come back to, to a lot of these points later in the discussion. Um, but for now, I'll turn to a set of presentations that more specifically look at programs targeting energy consumption and energy efficiency and their impacts on low-income households and their correlation with energy poverty. So first, we have with us Anna Realini, who is a researcher Hello. at uh, Ricera Sul Sistema Energetico, or RSC, which is Italy's uh, lead R&D organization for the energy sector. And her research is mainly focused on energy efficiency with a particular focus on energy poverty and its correlation to consumer well-being. And she's involved in a number of Italian and European uh, projects on this topic. So for today's discussion, Anna's presentation will mainly address a research project she's undertaken on the impacts of energy pov poverty and poor housing quality on health and well-being, focusing on the Italian city of Turin as a case study. So Anna, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this um, this intervention is related to the correlation uh, between energy poverty and health. Uh, it's a research that we took with the energy efficiency um, group inside RSE Ricerca sul Sistema Energetico in Italy. Next slide, please. Uh, so why we focused on energy poverty and health? Uh, um, we saw uh, we had uh, been working on energy poverty for some years and we saw that uh, in other european countries start countries starting from the uk but also in france and then in spain uh, there were some studies about the fact that some uh, um, some of the uh, indicators of bad quality of uh, a building could lead uh, to some uh, um, pathologies, some diseases, especially those where dampness to cold house or to hot house that are also related uh, to the definition of energy poverty according to the European Energy Poverty Observatory. Uh, and people living in these conditions uh, reported to suffer from premature death, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, pregnancy issues, mental health, uh, or dehydration when it's hot or hypothermia when it's cold. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, since we didn't see any study about this in Italy, we tried to understand whether the uh, English methodology that is very specific uh, uh, related to the country could be applied in Italy. Uh, we searched the literature and we saw that the World Health Organization um, suggests to keep the indoor temperatures between 18 and 24 degrees uh, to keep comfort, the optimal comfort for the people living there uh, where, with uh, some exception like children and their old people and uh, uh, the thermal comfort is of course related both to objective causes like for example air temperature air movement surface temperature and so on but also subjective causes like age gender health status activity levels and so on next slide please so we decided to try to find a methodology that could be applied to the Italian case to understand whether uh, there was a, a correlation or at least a relationship between being in bad health and being in energy poverty. Uh, the first step of this methodology was to understand which were the energy needs of the house. Uh, so for example, uh, not just heating as usually is associated uh, with energy poverty, but also cooling and in some cases, uh, electricity use, appliances use, and the calculation of the related energy costs for the household. Um, we applied the, ener the energy poverty indicator and uh, tried to calculate how many vulnerable households were and uh, how which were their characteristics. 
And uh, then we tried to find a linkage to the health status of the members of the households uh, to calculate the first whether there was a significant excess risk for them to um, be affected uh, by the relevant, relevant pathologies. And in the other case, to calculate the costs associated to the treatment of those uh, diseases. Uh, um, and then with those costs, we uh, propose to use those money, not literally, but figuratively, let's say, uh, to renovate uh, uh, low quality buildings in order to improve their efficiency and to allow poor people to um, live in a better environment, so uh, to not to contract those diseases. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, just very fast, we applied uh, a slightly modified energy poverty indicator. In Italy, the National Energy Strategy proposes uh, um, an indicator that is related to the low income, high cost indicator that is used uh, in the UK, and uh, uh, but uh, it's based uh, on the um, expenses of the family because in Italy there is no statistical database connecting the energy expenditure uh, to the income of the of a family uh, but uh, the their um, exp monthly expenditure threshold is used to define poverty in general we decided to uh, calculate the energy expenditure using a minimum energy need of the family uh, so uh, something that was calculated simulated with a computer course, uh, taking into account heating and cooling needs of the family uh, and also electricity use for appliances. Next slide, please. Uh, in general, these were the results. Uh, with our indicator, we calculated, for example, that with just heating expenses, 3.3 uh, uh, million families were uh, in energy poverty, uh, while if we added cooling, uh, uh, we arrived to 3.8 million families. Uh, uh, that is around 15% of the population. So the difference was around uh, 500,000 people, uh, households, sorry, in energy poverty. More we, when we consider cooling and not just eating. Next slide, please. Then uh, we decided to try uh, to find the correlation we have with health. Uh, the first barrier we found is uh, to have statistical databases that could be linked to the definition of energy poverty. Uh, for the whole Italian situation, we don't have one, and we didn't have one, and there is still no, a couple of years ago, and there is still no database linking those uh, aspects, but we were very, very lucky to find that just for the city of Turin and the surrounding region, Piedmont, it was possible to link the relevant variables that we found out were related to energy poverty um, to the census. And then uh, we cooperated with the local national health system office that uh, could give us uh, the occurrence, the number of occurrences uh, of premature death and pathologies uh, and so on, plus the cost associated to those, uh, uh, to the treatment of those pathologies. And so it was possible for the city of Turin and then to extend it to the region of Piedmont to evaluate and understand the health implication of energy poverty. Next, please. Uh, so first of all, we tried to understand which was the energy poverty distribution in Turin. We applied our, our methodology to calculate uh, energy poverty in Turin, and we found out that uh, there is, uh, there, the, the occurrence is slightly lower than in Italy, is around 9% instead of 15%. And, um, it amounts to around 34.6 thousand families, and they are mostly in the northern and southern part of the city that are also the industrialized part, the ones where the factories are, so the former like blue collar uh, uh, areas of the city, so uh, areas where uh, uh, there are less rich people and more poor people in general, but also energy poor people are mostly in those areas. Next, please. Uh, then uh, we, uh, uh, and to get this, we used the input data, the household budget survey uh, from the Italian National Statistical Office that allowed us to define energy poverty and to understand the relevant variables. Then we applied it 
to the Turin census, uh, there is a mistake here, it's 2001 and 2011, and to the National Health System database, and here as well there is a mistake, 2001-2019. We use the health indicator, premature death under the age of 70, cardiovascular diseases, heart attacks, cerebrovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, chronic, sub chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and children asthma, those were the ones that were in the literature related to energy poverty and health. Uh, at the end, we found that at least for the case of Turing, children asthma was not significant. So we, uh, I will not present the result for this case because uh, it was not strictly associated with energy poverty, at least for Turing. Next, please. So for premature death, uh, for all the causes, we divided our uh, people uh, uh, in two groups, those that were resident uh, in Turin in 2001, and we imagined to follow them up to 2010. And then we had the next census in 2011. So we uh, chose to uh, follow those that were resident in 2011 after 2019. For premature death, you can see that the spread is uh, very similar to uh, the one that we saw in the energy poverty distribution, northern and southern area are the ones that are most affected. And there is an excess risk for people in energy poverty between that was 8% between 2001 and 2010, and it increased to 25% in the next decade. Uh, for cardiovascular diseases, we can see a similar distribution as well, and the excess risk is uh, constant at 15%. Next, please. For heart attacks, uh, we have, uh, as I, I will not say, we have almost the same distribution for all the causes, let's say. But for heart attacks, we have uh, 15 and 13 percent increased risk for people in energy poverty. For cerebrovascular diseases, around 17 percent in both decades, with a surprising green area in the north, uh, greener area in the north. Next, please. For respiratory diseases in general, uh, plus 18% and plus 28% in the last decade, uh, same distribution as always, and, the for, and for COPD, plus 23% in the first decade and plus 55% in the next decade. And uh, don't ask me about this because we asked our epidemiology expert from the National Health System, and he said he doesn't know why, but the result, uh, he checked the results twice because we wanted to be sure, and he said that this, this is the increase in the occurrence of uh, in the excess risk uh, for people in energy poverty in the last decade. Next slide, please. So we decided to extend the study to uh, Piedmont region. We calculated the distribution of energy poverty in Piedmont and we see that it's between 12 and 15%. Uh, with uh, Novara that is on the border with Lombardy, the region of Milan around 15%, and uh, the Tori province, not just the city, around 12%, so is the lowest one. Uh, next slide, please. And we uh, calculated the, the cost for each province of the treatment, just the hospital treatment, the hospitalization cost for each of these pathologies. So the, the ones that I presented before, how much they cumulatively cost to the Piedmont region, so the state at the end, uh, each year. And we found out that for each year, 24 million euros per year are uh, paid by the region just to treat energy poor people. So these are just the excess costs, those that are uh, incurred by the region due to the fact that uh, energy poor people are more at risk of contracting those diseases. Uh, next slide, please. So we asked ourselves, what can we do uh, for energy poor people to renovate their house with 24 million euros per year from 2022 to 2030. So we said, okay, let's try to renovate the buildings. We took the, um, the buildings that were most affected by energy poverty, that were single family and small condominium, nine to 15 apartments in climate zone E that uh, is uh, predominant in the area that we studied, the Piedmont region, and with construction time between 1961 and 1975, non-renovated since then. We set uh, heating and cooling time according to Italian registration, uh, legislation, and UNITS uh, 11,300. 
and uh, we uh, estimated their energy needs for heating, cooling, and appliances. Next slide, please. Uh, then uh, we tried uh, to uh, intervene in three ways. First of all, the thermal, thermal insulation of vertical walls, then the thermal insulation of the roof, windows and doors replacement, and the complete retrofit that was a combination of all the above. For the cost of interventions, we used the ones that were, are the maximum allowed under the latest Italian law about uh, uh, energy uh, efficiency in uh, buildings that are very conservative because they are very high. For example, uh, uh, they set the, the threshold for uh, vertical walls insulation at 200 euros per square meter. I just did it and they paid 100, so they are quite conservative usually. And we calculated that for walls insulation, a single family household spend, should spend 37,000 euros, uh, roof insulation 10,000, new windows doors 7,800, and a complete retrofit 55,000 to almost 56,000. A small condo minimum, of course, spends much more, but we have to consider uh, the cost for each apartment. Next slide, please. So we uh, estimated by uh, what we could do with those 24 million euros, uh, calculating, uh, uh, splitting, of course, uh, the 24 million euros in two parts, uh, around 10%, that was the, uh, let's say, the amount of single wall, uh, uh, single family um, buildings uh, in en for energy for people, and uh, around 90%, that is the uh, amount of energy for people living in small condominium. And we found out that we could, uh, um, let's say, renovate, for example, with walls insulation uh, from 2022 to 2030, 756 houses, where, while if we do roof insulation, we can go up to 2,600. And if we replace windows and doors, 3,600. The same we did uh, for the small condominium, considering the cost per each apartment that is related to the household, because it's not for sure that in the same condominium, all the people are energy poor. So just uh, one or two apartments might have people in energy poverty. And then uh, we tried to understand uh, how many households would come out of energy poverty if we use all those 24 million euros per year. Uh, that is, if we just do walls insulation is 4%. If we decide to insulate, the roof is 29%. If we decide to replace the windows or doors is 11%. And with a complete retrofit, that is all the above three uh, measures, 3%. We also calculated the uh, overall energy savings and we found out that the best uh, um, achievements are with walls insulation or roof insulation. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, just to conclude, uh, we found out that energy poverty and health are related, and for energy poor people, there is a higher risk of contracting several pathologies, especially related to the respiratory system or their ca cardiovascular system. Uh, to the Italian, we cannot apply the UK methodology to the Italian case because we have different statistical databases uh, and we don't have the statistical data that are used in the UK where this methodology is proven and solid and that has been applied for many, many years. Uh, so we proposed a new methodology and we tested it uh, in the case of Turin and we found out that in those areas of the city where energy poverty is higher, uh, there is a higher risk of hospitalization for people that are in energy poverty. Uh, and in those areas, we have also a building stock that is quite older than uh, in the richer area of, of the city, or at least is worse in terms of energy efficiency. Um, and the, the main buildings in those areas are especially those built in the 50s, 70s, where there was a financial boom, so they had to build a lot of uh, buildings in a very short time, uh, especially for blue collar workers that were going to the cities uh, to work in the factories, uh, in the new factories that were uh, opened after the war or that were reopened after the war. The war. And uh, um, we also checked whether energy poor families were also in Kampur and we found out that the, that the difference is with, uh, around uh, five, uh, 500,000 households in Italy and vice versa. Next slide, please. Uh, 
an effective way to reduce energy poverty might be to renovate buildings and to increase their energy efficiency. So we reduce the expenses of the health system. We tried to calculate for Turin and Piedmont region with typical buildings uh, that uh, I just showed you, and the results are satisfactory, but uh, we have some barriers that uh, don't allow us to extend the study beyond Piedmont borders because we don't have uh, the detailed census data for each region that could allow us to detail for each municipality, for each climate zone, the uh, energy poverty incidence. Uh, the health data are not directly available, so uh, national health system uh, has them, but they don't always have the census data related to those people, to the people they have in their uh, database. The data about the average cost per hospitalization uh, uh, can vary between the regions because we didn't use the standard tables, but we use those that hospitals used that uh, might be higher or lower depending on the number of days they are in the hospital and the number of uh, um, issues they encounter. And uh, uh, the building census relate is uh, not uh, relatable to all individuals. So uh, <laughs> there is an issue of relating the building, the family, and their health status. Uh, so there are no databases that are linked, uh, that can link all those variables. Next slide, please. Uh, moreover, some policy suggestions, the current energy efficiency funding system in Italy is non effective because it covers only part of the expenses and uh, it's necessary to access to different financing forms that are not available usually for vulnerable people. The consumers shall anticipate the costs usually in Italy uh, and uh, again, access to different financing forms. Bureaucracy is quite complex, uh, so several professionals are needed, for example, an architect uh, that, uh, that gives a certificate of energy efficiency before and after the intervention, uh, so, um, an accountant that certifies that the architect uh, calculations are correct and so on, and all of them cost quite a lot, like 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 euros each, and for a vulnerable family this is a very high cost. Uh, moreover, many energy poor consumers in Italy live in rented houses, especially in cities, not so many in the rural areas, so they can't renovate and the owner doesn't have interest in, in renovating. So we have to find out how to overcome these barriers. A proposal is for those consumers that are also owners of their house, a progressive renovation incentives based on income level, inversely proportional, of course, so the lower the income, the higher the incentive and specific funding for owners that renovate houses where energy poor consumers live. So they renovate, they can uh, uh, be paid back uh, of their uh, investment, but they without having to increase uh, the, the fee, the rental fee, when the house is renovated. How to finance this? Uh, well, some proposal could be like they do in other European countries, so uh, special social bonds, or uh, uh, use the energy efficiency obligation schemes, uh, like in some other European countries, if I remember correctly, for example, France, Ireland, the UK, they have obligation schemes uh, dedicated to energy poverty, specifically dedicated to energy poverty, like white certificates dedicated to energy poverty. Next slide, please. So this is the end for of the presentation. Thank you very much for attending. And if you have any questions, you can just ask now or you can send uh, the questions to the email address you see there. It's received by the whole energy poverty team that is me and two other colleagues uh, in uh, RSC. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. And there's lots of very relevant insights from this research, um, but also important to understand how Sometimes methodologies need to be adapted or adopted fresh, given given different contexts. Um, so next, um, we will turn to our next presentation, and we're very pleased to have Mariana Weiss de Abro, who is an energy research analyst at the Brazilian Energy Research Office. She's previously worked as a consultant at both the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank. Um, Mariana's research uh, focuses on energy consumption patterns demand response, smart grids, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and distributed generation. And for today's discussion, Mariana will share with us some findings from a study she led assessing residential electricity consumption by income class for various appliances. 
to better understand consumption patterns that can support more targeted policies that, that benefit lower income segments of society. So uh, Mariana, please go ahead with your presentation. Thanks for the introduction, Divya. And again, thanks for inviting EPE for joining this important event. So today we prepared this presentation to discuss a challenge topic, that is how can energy efficiency programs mitigate energy poverty and socioeconomic disparities? Please, the next one. So to answer this question, we need to discuss further the steps of the energy efficient programs implementation. The first step is in identifying the target public that the energy efficiency program aims to achieve. The second step is designing and implementing the energy efficient program per se in an accessible and transparent way. The third step is monitoring indicators to evaluate the program in order to propose possible improvements in a second phase of implementation. Therefore, an energy efficient program must understand the heterogeneity of households' energy consumption patterns, especially if this program aims to mitigate energy poverty and socioeconomic disparities. That seems a little bit obvious, but in many developing countries as Brazil, we still do, we still do not have is official statistics on households' energy consumption patterns is aggregated by income class, climate zones, and home, household composition. And this is, is particularly concerning once those are exactly the countries that normally count with the huge socioeconomic disparities. The lack of these disaggregated statistics can make it harder to identify the most vulnerable groups without access to clean, modern, and affordable energy service. As a consequence, it's even harder to design, design well-target public policy with low cost for mitigating energy poverty and social economic disparities. So please, the next slide. With this question in mind, the Brazilian Energy Research Office, the EPE, is implementing a new research agenda focused on in understanding the heterogeneity of the residential sector's energy consumption patterns in Brazil. We hope with this bring evidence on energy poverty issues in the country, identify vulnerable groups, propose monitoring indicators, and in that way to contribute for the design of well-targeted energy efficiency programs able to tackle energy poverty issues. The first publicated study of this new EPE's agenda is the fact sheet residential electricity consumption by income class. The next slide, please. The objective of this study was to estimate the electricity consumption of households of different income class in Brazil. For this, we used a bottom-up estimation approach using the residential sector's energy demand model developed by EP. And the data came from the National Electrical Energy Conservation Program, the PROCEL, and the Brazilian Institute for Geography and Statistics, the IBGE. The next one, please. So let's discuss the results of the study. The first results that we'd like to highlight is the evidence of existing a substantial inequality in the access to electricity service by households of different income class in Brazil. That disparity reflects the huge inequality of income distribution that has historically marked the country. To give you a On a clear idea of the disparity, let's analyze the annual per capita electricity consumption of the poorest and the richest households in Brazil in 2019. Households in the lowest income class here in the left consume on average 307 kilowatt hour, what is equivalent to the average of Morocco. 
this electricity per capita consumption was enough to feed only one door fridge and three lead bulbs. In contrast, households in the highest income class consumed on average more than 2,200 kilowatt hour per capita, what is equivalent to Japan. That means that the richest households in Brazil consume around six times more electricity than the poorest households in the country. So in the next slide, please, we can see that this disparity in electricity per capita consumption highlights in one hand the concentration of electricity consumption in the higher income households, and in the other hand, the presence of energy poverty in the lower income class. But how can we monitor this inequality in electricity consumption distribution by income class in order to help in the evaluation of public policy? In this study, we propose an indicator to do that. And you see how it works in the next slide, please. The indicator's name is Residential Sectors Electrical Gini Index. The Gini Index shows the relation between the percentual participation of a specific group of people on the whole population, as you can see in the hor horizontal X, and the percentual participation of these groups' electricity consumption on the whole national residential electricity demand, as you can see in their vertical X. This relation is represented by the Lorentz curve displayed here in the graph in orange. The electrical Gini index then is calculated based on the area between this Lorentz curve in orange and a 45 degree curve here displayed in blue that represents the perfect inequality absence in the electricity consumption distribution. The larger is this area between the two curves, the larger is the inequality and the Gini index. It's important to say also that this Gini index vary between zero and one as other Gini index that everyone knows. And when it's equal zero, there is no inequality, what means that all families would present the same electricity consumption. And in the other hand, if this index is equal to one, that means that the maximal concentration and one single family would be responsible for consuming all countries' electricity demand. The next slide, please. We then, in this study, calculated this methodology of the Gini index for Brazil from 2005 and 2019. And we see that, we see that till 2014, the indicator decreased, which means that the electricity consumption concentration was reduced. However, in 2015, the Gini index changed its course and started to show an upward and indicating an increased concentration of electricity consumption in the higher income class. We understand that the Gini index growth in those five, last five years could be related to the intensification of socioeconomic disparities and the increase of electricity tariffs verified in Brazil in the same period. Those results then show that monitoring the proposed Gini index together with the electricity per capita consumption could improve the evaluation of public policy folks on reducing energy poverty and socioeconomic disparities. Next slide, please. We also, in this fact sheet, analyze the heterogeneity of residential sectors, electricity consumption patterns by home appliance. The, the, the refrigerator, air conditioner, and electric shower had the highest average per capita electricity consumption. Despite its high per capita consumption, the air conditioner was the equipment that showed the more heterogeneous electricity consumption by income class. That can be explained by the fact that only 18% of the Brazilian households, mainly those with higher incomes, present the air conditioners. In contrast, the Brazilian households use normally fans for cooling. That it's a little bit, it, it wasn't what we would expect because Brazil it's a tropical country with higher, uh, higher temperatures, 
throughout the year. And air conditioner were expected to be the most common appliance. But it's still, it seems to be still a kind of socially distinctive appliance, probably due to the its costly high energy consumption and the elevated investment cost. The next slide, please. Now looking at the total electricity consumption of all main appliances together by income class, it's interesting to note that electricity consumption tends to rise as households income increase. That happens because income is translated into ownership of home appliance, its use habits, and in the power and capacity of those devices. In that way, this kind of analysis allows us to easily identify vulnerable groups in energy poverty conditions, as well as uh, their potential energy efficient gains and also their suppressed demand for electricity service that could be met by boosting target energy subsidies and energy efficiency programs. For instance, here we would emphasize that refrigerators are the appliance responsible for the largest electricity consumption in nine of 10 Brazilian households. Therefore, despite of the implemented energy efficient programs in Brazil, refrigerators seem to still have a considerable energy efficient potential. So a more intense energy efficient program folks on refrigerator and aware of heterogeneity of households consumption patterns could increase the energy efficiency in the Brazilian residential sector. So now let's go to the conclusions. The next slide. So concluding, this study shows that the energy access does not depend only on the extension and connection to the grid. People can be connected to the grid and still have a suppressed demand for energy service because of their income constraints. That highlights that the importance of existing public policy focus on improving access to energy service by lower income households. Another important evidence is that income distribution inequality is refle reflect in the household's electricity consumption patterns. In this way, the socioeconomic restrictions experienced by lower income households lead to a restrained demand for energy service. Therefore, those families tend to present a smaller amount of home appliance with lower power and or more restrictive habit of use in order to spend, spend less money paying for the electricity bills. The next slide, please. And in addition, we highlight that the residential sector's electrical Gini index is a powerful tool for measuring and monitoring the electricity, the inequality in the access to energy service, and that it could help in the evaluation of public policy folks on reducing energy poverty. However, for, for do this, it's necessary to collect data on ownership, power, usage, usage hub, habits of home appliance by income class. And we call attention to that because understanding the heterogeneity of residential sectors electricity consumption by income class can help to design more effective and lower costly energy efficiency and subsidy policies. The same is valid for energy planning. Understanding the different electricity consumption patterns by income class improves the residential sector's energy demand forecasting models. These models enable more accurate energy demand projections in line with the sustainable, de de sustainable development agenda, what is extremely important for energy planning in developing countries. So the next slide, please. Yeah, this is what we prepared for today. Do not forget to access our fact sheets and other EPEs study at the EPEs website. 
and thank you very much. And here is my email if you want to get in touch. And also the, then I will be able to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mariana. Um, and there are a lot of policy implications we can unpack in this analysis, but it really also highlights how an essential building block for good policy design is having, having good access to data uh, and along the right categories. Um, I'd also invite all our participants to continue to submit questions through the Q&A, which um, all our speakers will, will have a chance to, to address um, after the presentations. Um, but next, we, we have a set of presentations that also look at socioeconomic impacts of clean energy policies, but this time more focused on programs to expand renewable energy. Uh, to that end, uh, first we have Kate Anderson, who is the Chief of St uh, Staff for Energy Systems Integration at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the U.S. Kate supports uh, operations and strategic planning activities at NREL, specifically power systems, energy security and resilience, and decision science. Um, she also coordinates the energy justice activities across NREL. And today, Kate will discuss with us the findings from a study that she led that modeled pathways and implications for the city of Los Angeles um, to achieve a target of 100% renewable energy, including um, assessing the local distributional social impacts of that target. So uh, Kate, please go ahead with your presentation. Great, thank you. Hi everybody, it's great to be here this morning. Um, as Divya mentioned, my name is Kate Anderson. Um, I lead our energy justice work at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, our vision at NREL is a clean energy future for the world, and achieving that vision really relies on equity and justice because it relies on bringing everybody along. So not just the wealthy or the early adopters, but those who can least afford this transition as well. Um, and the project I'll be talking about today, LA 100 Equity Strategies, is really one of the most forward thinking projects in the U.S. right now in terms of trying to achieve that equity. Um, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is the utility in Los Angeles, and they have committed to trying to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035, um, while also improving equity in that transition. Uh, next slide, please. So the Los Angeles 100% Renewable Energy Study started in 2018. NREL um, partnered with the Department of Water and Power to analyze pathways that LA could take to achieve this goal of 100% clean energy. And we found that there were multiple pathways to get there, uh, multiple technical and economically achievable pathways, but that that would require a rapid deployment of wind and solar and storage technologies in this decade. Uh, next slide. And the study found that while all communities will benefit um, from those clean energy scenarios, improving equity in the participation and in the outcomes really requires intentionally designed equity strategies. Next slide. And so we have a follow-on study now um, called LA100 Equity Strategies that really picks up where the original LA100 study left off to identify strategies to achieve those community prioritized equity outcomes in the transition to 100% clean energy. Next slide. And here, you know, LA is really facing a huge challenge, as I think are many cities around the world. Um, as I mentioned, you know, reaching 100% requires bringing everyone along, even those who can't afford it. And Los Angeles, while it's home to some of the US's wealthiest population, it's also home to 30% of California's population living in poverty. So that's a big um, challenge, figuring out how to bring that really diverse population along in this transition. The second challenge, and this is not unique to LA, is that the current energy system is inequitable. So I think many of us know that disadvantaged communities experience more burdens and fewer benefits of the energy system. And making this transition equitable will really require a major shift on, in how investments are allocated. Um, the third challenge that it may be somewhat unique to LA is that they have legislation that prevents them from meeting investor-owned utility affordability standards. And so in order to really address issues like rate affordability, that will require ballot initiatives or legislative changes. And then last 
um, you know, equity really requires community involvement and underserved communities, probably every, everywhere, but including in NLA, have really not participated in decision making historically and are really seeking greater involvement in solutions moving forward. And so LA is trying to address all of these challenges through their transition. Next slide. So this project is organized around three tenets of justice. And by organizing around these three tenets, we try to develop strategies that address each of them. So in terms of recognition justice, we think about how we can understand and address the past and current energy inequities. So those um, you know, historic um, challenges of things like redlining that have caused a lot of today's inequities. We also are thinking about how we can enable community leadership in the process. So how do we make sure that the communities are part of the decision making and are um, really informing the programs and policies going forward? And then third, distributional justice. So how do we ensure a just and equitable distribution of both the benefits, but also the negative impacts of a clean energy transition? And so this study is really focused around developing strategies in each of those three areas. Next slide. So how we operationalize that, particularly the, the procedural aspects, is that we developed um, three committees. So the first is a steering committee based on community-based organizations that are already active in Los Angeles around energy issues. And with those community-based organizations, we met with them monthly and they provided strategic and technical direction and really tried to ensure that community members' voices were heard and involved in this process of developing strategies. We also had an advisory committee. So the advisory committee was made up of city departments that provided feedback on the feasibility of the strategies and particularly how the strategies could potentially partner with other ongoing city programs because um, there are already a lot of efforts in the city of Los Angeles. So we wanted to ensure that these strategies were not being developed in a vacuum, but that would really um, leverage all of the existing programs that the city is already investing in. And then finally, we held community specific listening sessions. So these were a series of 15 listening sessions that we held in different neighborhoods within Los Angeles, where we heard directly from the community members themselves um, to understand really what their priorities were and how we could address the challenges that they were facing. Next slide. And so through that process, we were able to develop a set of community informed strategies. Um, that started by identifying community priorities. So over on the left, you'll see that through those, the steering committee, as well as through the listening sessions, there were four themes that really emerged as the top priorities for the community. And I imagine, you know, these are pretty general and would probably be top, top priorities in many communities, but that included energy affordability and energy burden, um, access to and actual use of technologies and programs, health, safety, and resilience, and then jobs. And so then we developed um, pathways that addressed each of those community priorities. And we have a few examples here. So for example, to address affordability and burdens, we focused on low income energy bill stability that could lead to more affordable rates and utility debt relief. We looked at how we could reduce transportation energy burdens through more equitable adoption of electric transportation opportunities. Within access and use, we really focused on building weatherization and cooling um, because in LA, there's many people that do not have cooling and this is leading to really dangerous home temperature exposures. So we thought about how we could increase access to cooling for their most vulnerable residents. We also looked at solar and efficiency access, particularly for renters and multifamily households that have not always had access to things like solar. Within health and safety and resilience, we really focused on truck electrification. Um, we found that this was one of the highest sources of negative air quality health impacts, especially in disadvantaged communities. And by, by electrifying trucks, that was one of the uh, most effective ways to produce cleaner air and better health outcomes, especially for those disadvantaged communities that tend to be located near the major highways. We also looked at ability to increase resilience through both grid upgrades and by increasing access to critical services during outages. And then finally, we looked at jobs and workforce development and how new clean energy jobs could be part of this clean energy transition. Next slide. 
And so the study is due to come out this July. So we right now we are in the process of developing the strategies and um, really putting some costs and benefit numbers to them and trying to prioritize and think about how you might stage all of these various strategies. Um, but here I just wanted to give you a few examples of what the strategies may look like. So within procedural equity, we're thinking a lot about how you engage residents in developing programs and services that are really targeted to community priorities. Um, this procedural equity section also includes thinking about how you design community outreach with local trusted messengers, um, how you design job programs that provide equitable access to training opportunities and well-paid jobs, and sort of a, a host of other things that really think about how do you include communities in the process. Um, the second category we have here is around low-income energy bill affordability. So here we are thinking around about rate design strategies, um, which includes everything from just simplified rate structures that um, consumers can better understand, all the way to income-based fixed charges, um, which is currently under consideration in California, though I think um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, about that still. Um, this also includes more robust low-income assistance programs. In terms of housing weatherization and resilience, um, we're lo really looking at opportunities to deploy cooling in low and moderate income multifamily households that currently have no cooling to really reduce that dangerous heat exposure that I mentioned before. Um, and here we're looking at tailored um, strategies that may differ between single family and multifamily homes. Within transportation, we are thinking about how we can expand access to both electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging infrastructure for low-income households that are expected to adopt electric vehicles by 2035. We're also looking at more um, what we call multimodal transportation options. So this includes e-bikes, e-scooters, and improved transit that could improve both affordability and access to destinations for some of those households that don't currently have a car. Um, I mentioned earlier truck electrification for air quality. So here we're looking at how we can establish community-wide heavy-duty truck electrification goals, specifically focusing on heavy, heavy-duty trucks, which is a particular segment of that truck electrification um, sector um, that produces the most NOx emissions. And then within the distribution grids sector, we're looking at a variety of strategies, um, including things like, can we increase investment in underground cables and disadvantaged communities, which currently have a lower proportion of their cables underground, in order to increase reliability and resilience during disaster events. Um, we're also looking at how we can increase access to critical services to ensure that if the grid does go down, um, residents have access to things like cooling centers um, to ensure that they are safe during an outage. Next slide. Um, and so I'll just finish with some key takeaways here. Um, I think the first thing that we've really learned is that equitable implementation will really require long-term utility community partnerships. And this is something that has not historically been a strength for many utilities around the U.S. and that more and more uh, we're seeing is really important in this transition, especially when we want to make sure that we include these vulnerable populations as we transition. So I think for many utilities, this is a new role um, that will take time to build. And um, we're just starting, you know, in LADWP to see that that start to take hold. Um, the second here is, again, I'm sure not surprising to anyone that funding the transition to 100% clean energy is really going to be a challenge. Um, we heard from the communities that affordability and access are their primary concerns. And I think especially in communities where people are already struggling with poverty, thinking about how we fund this transition is really important. Um, as we do that, it's important to recognize that the baseline investments are inequitable. 
Um, so in Los Angeles, for example, we looked at where the current um, utility programs are going. So where things like electric vehicle or solar incentives are going. And many of those baseline investments are disproportionately going to, you know, wealthier communities, whereas disadvantaged communities are not receiving as much of those investments. And so I think LA going forward intends to make a shift there in how their investments are allocated. Um, despite these challenges, which are huge. Um, I think this study does show essential strategies to implementing this long-term path to an equitable clean energy transition. Um, and I think that the methodology used here and many of the resulting strategies are applicable, be applicable beyond Los Angeles. So while this study was specifically focused on LA and um, you know, used data from LA, I think many of the strategies here could apply to other cities around the world. Uh, next slide. So that is all I have for you this morning. Um, I welcome questions later on in the discussion or you can reach out to me via email. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Kate. Um, and it's really important to note that these specific design elements are needed to be intentionally incorporated into policy development to, to ensure these uh, equitable and progressive outcomes. Um, okay, so now we will turn to our last presentation from Dr. Festus Boma who is a research associate and fellow at the University of Beirut's um, Faculty of Biology, Chemistry, and Earth Sciences. His research uh, focus areas include renewable energy and socio-technical relations, biofuel land deals and land politics, climate change, food security, rural livelihoods, and green governance. And today, Dr. Boma's presentation will focus on a study that he did that analyzed decentralized solar systems in the context of Africa, highlighting some challenges associated with maximizing the social benefits of this technology in, in the local context. Um, so Dr. Boma, over to you. Right, thank you. Good, so um, I have a lot of slides, uh, many of which are focused. So um, I will try as much as possible to rush through and during the question session, then perhaps I can engage uh, more on those. So yes, my work is focusing on Africa and I'm drawing from uh, my postdoc research and current projects we have in Lesotho, Mozambique and Namibia as well as Kenya. Right, please you can go to the next slide. Okay, so before proceeding, I would like to just give, um, uh, I mean, uh, I characterize electrification regime in Africa so that you can understand uh, the context of the work, and then um, we will get to know um, more towards the end what I want to suggest uh, uh, for consideration. So one, um, um, African electrification regimes are more market-oriented and state-driven. And the point is that um, the state has built electricity as its cash cow. And so the state uh, is trying as much as possible uh, to, to create that kind of uh, you know, market orientation because people are already uh, you know, not, are not able to pay cost reflective tariffs. So the state does so, so that it will be able to use the energy or electricity provision as a way of uh, enacting uh, collectively binding decisions and also to be able to generate needed uh, revenues when necessary. And the next thing is there's entrenched spatial inequalities and, and bureaucratic neglect in electrical grid infrastructure. This happens across uh, and for a number of reasons, um, because the state uh, builds its electricity infrastructure around, along a least cost uh, you know, philosophy or thoughts what it happens is that in areas that are seen uh, to be far remote or not to not to have the I mean not to have a population that have high uh, purchasing power, then the state directly or indirectly you know you know neglects such groups of people or such locations. The next thing is prioritization of urban locations, high income groups, public facilities and neglect of households. And this is very important that in many areas, and it has been uh, you know, a historical phenomenon that um, only government facilities and industrial setups were prioritized. 
and households were really ignored in the process in, in many remote locations. And then we come to off grid electrification and the production of second class energy systems. And maybe if there was time, I would throw more, on, more light on this. I'm working from energy geography, specifically <clears throat> the, you know, energy justice or just transition perspective. So I am very interested in these that kinds of um, uh, framings. Um, throughout Africa, there is this higher preference for uh, centralized electrical grids. Okay, and it is because of uh, these are effects of um, modern infrastructure ideal, which is that during and after the colonial regime, the state wanted to modern, modernize the population and also extend its territorial control through centralized systems. Okay, because of this, there is that preference for centralized grids because that served as as the pivot of the state, you know, you know modernization, you know, initiatives. Before this reason, off-grid electrification or off-grid infrastructure is perceived as inferior technology that reduces those sections of the population to second-class citizens. And I will show more. I will show more photos about this in towards uh, the presentation. Then the next thing is heterogeneous infrastructure configurations. And this is very important um, when we uh, uh, try to situate energy transitions in the South, particularly in Africa, that we, because of the perceived uh, inefficiency of state institutions in the provision of, 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 of not only electricity, but other, I mean, basic or essential, you know, um, services, there, there are always alternatives, even in terms of water supply, you see that many Ghanaians, many Kenyans, many people in Africa, they have, uh, they have self-organized the provision of these essential services so that in case the state fails to provide their So you see a, a what we, it's called a, you know, a infrastructure coexistence. We have the centralized network, formal ones existing alongside uh, you know, safe organized world. And then there is a shift towards many grace from standalone, you know, uh, decentralized system because, uh, this, for example, the state thinks that it's very complicated managing rooftop technologies and, 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 and then um, also take revenues from this, or they are not really able to, you know, uh, you know, uh, Support the you know in that uh, industrial activities, sorry, um, income generation activities. So there is more shift towards mini grid systems, which are seen as better place to save a ledger session of of the of the remote locations. Okay, and then this is very important because when you look at such regime where the state is ambivalent towards letting go or allowing a full-blown electrification, uh, a full-blown decentralized systems, then such mini grids that require state support become very, 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 very you know, challenging. And I will talk uh, more on that uh, shortly. Please, can you go to the next slide? So now these, uh, these are the various forms of electrification options we have, the centralized, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, uh, you know these decentralized system those that are to provide uh, I mean uh, to provide uh, I mean water pumping uh, and then the mini grid systems and then we have a complete rooftop systems together with a water heat solar water heating systems and these are the issues uh, and that surround the, the kind of technology we have one important thing here is that Contrary to the Western notions of innovation, which, re, which means a new thing is coming to displace the other in the setting of Africa and also in many other you know, global South regions, these alternatives do not necessarily displace the centralized or the most established ones. And I will talk more on this also towards the end. Please, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so now let's look at what are the opportunities or what are the upsides and the downsides of, uh, of the decentralized system. There are funding issues and private sector exploitation. Now in Ghana, 
the Gamin government introduced um, rooftop solar just to reduce dependencies on the centralized grids when the country experienced erratic power supply. And so what happened was that there were, uh, you know, um, collaborations between um, the Ghana's Energy Commission and other energy agencies and then uh, financial institutions to provide, uh, you know, some kind of support for people. But here, the conditions like you have to be a salaried worker, you have to produce bank statement and all these, may not many could provide. So what happens was what happened was that people who could assess this uh, were few, and they have to also pay high interest rates on loans that are provided. So many uh, um, um, uh, decentralized systems we have in Ghana are, to, are financed through personal income savings. And that is very challenging, especially given the high upfront cost of solar PV systems. Okay. Then we also have, um, uh, people have to make special arrangements with solar energy providers. Yeah. Then in Namibia, the internal world is called Solar Revolving Fund. And here again, this was supposed to allow uh, lower income groups to assess the facility. But here again, how many people are able to provide uh, you know, uh, bank accounts or pay slips and then show uh, you know, that they have the capacity to pay or repay the loan. So in the, in the end, only the rural elites are able to afford and not many can really assess the facility. And then we come to Kenya, where the government did so well to uh, reduce import duties and then uh, uh, and then VAT um, on solar appliances. Surprisingly, that same year, towards October 2013, he imposed you know VAT of about 16 percent. On so there's, there, there's that kind of ambivalence towards <coughs> sorry, um, the, you know, decentralized systems. And then also one challenge that Kenya, although has introduced a, a regulation uh, for solar PV technicians, yet people are not able to pay or afford the services by the licensed uh, technicians. So they end up, you know, falling in, in the hands of, of quack or, or inexperienced uh, installers who charge, uh, who charge low cost, but they, I mean, they don't are able to do them in a very competent way and it gives problems to the very users in the in rural areas. Please, can you go to the next slide, please? Then here, one important point I was mentioning here is that if you check, because not many, especially in Kenya, people who are far away or considered to be in remote locations and therefore ineligible for the grade, they have to brace themselves for these kind of plug and play systems and some are paying 50 Kenyan shillings uh, a, a day and others are paying uh, even more. And depending on the arrangement they make, okay, pay through the M-Pesa or the mobile money transfer. But take note here, when, when you calculate this, before they own the systems, they some pay between 1,500 to 3,700 3, per month until their own system. And this is too expensive for rural people. And more, more import importantly, they can use these facilities to run economically productive activities, except for providing lights. You see here, yeah, small radio uh, for security lights and then uh, television, even you cannot watch it beyond four hours, uh, you know, depending on the weather conditions. So this is what the rural people have to brace themselves for. And in the end, they, they, they seem to be paying sometimes two, three times more than what the electricity distributor KPLC charges. Okay, please can you go to the next slide? Now, the same thing applies here. The solar uh, services provided by this, uh, a, a, a company called MCOPA. Uh, these are really accessible, or, or but the affordability is a challenge for the rural population. Please, can you go to the next slide? Good. Very interesting point here. The so-called pro-poor uh, slogan being used to sort of champion the uh, the the solar PV, uh, you know, uh, systems. It does not support uh, the you know the so the the rural poor or the poorest of the poor. Okay, so um, 
It does not support the rural poor, so to speak. Here, these are elite homes that use the solar, okay? They push other appliances like electric, ironing, microwave, and the they push those to the grid. And then the rest of the load are taken care of by the solar PV. So at the end of the day, they fall within the lifeline tariffs. If when we check here, yeah, maybe time will not allow me to go, but the, the, the more, I mean, the, the, the higher pitches they make, the fewer units of electricity they get. So they use this uh, solar systems to reduce the consumption so that they fall within the lifeline you know, range. So in the end, such a system benefits the poor, sorry, the rich, but the poor who, who are supposed to benefit because when the government reduced the import duties on, 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 on and then VAT on this small scale solar you know, components, the intention was to really support the, you know, the poorest social groups. But here, the, uh, I mean, the elites are benefiting more than the poor because of these setups. Please, can you go to the next slide? Then here again, this is a professor at the Moy University in Edward who had strategically installed this system. So he has you know, home-based micro enterprises and then he pushed activities like the incubation of the eggs and other things on the solar and then other appliances. So in the end, he's able to make savings, a lot of savings. But here again, this costs almost 3,000 um, US dollars. How many people can do? So the, the more efficient systems can only be you know, purchased by higher income groups and the poor fall in the range, the inefficient ones which cannot really uh, you know, uh, permit um, small scale uh, businesses. Okay, and note that one striking thing here is that almost every African you know, home is a micro business unit. So if the energy services that cannot support uh, you know, economically productive activities, then become very challenging. Please, can you move to the next slide? Okay, and the same year, this is uh, a, you know a, um, a, a, a you know a higher income uh, household or a higher income households in an in in you know in the in the gated community in Ghana, and they have all installed solar PV systems because it helps them to reduce expenditure. Okay, they just buy prepaid meters, they check storage, they buy prepaid credits. And they, they load it on their system, and then there is something that notifies them on the con about the consumption. So when they are consuming so much, then they switch to solar. Okay. So at the end of the day, they are, they, there's this statement that if you have solar, you have your own akosumbo in Ghana. The power generate uh, the hydroelectric, uh, you know, plant or, or the hydro hydroelectricity uh, generation point is is called akosumbo. So this is more like a it's a metaphor which is being used to show that people who have solar can have some kind of autonomy in terms of controlling how much they consume and of course uh, energy you know expenditure right so this is a very important thing and i will show the very poor people don't have this kind of opportunity because they can only afford the small inefficient systems so here again it benefits the the higher social class or the higher income groups please next slide and, and the same thing applies here that the, and the solar PV systems, this actually, when the Ghana Energy Commission introduced solar subsidy uh, 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 program, uh, the conditions like people who have controller or battery or have LED light, the eligibility conditions were fulfilled by higher income groups needing surplus energy to cut their, their overall monthly energy expenditure. So here again, people were buying more solar PV systems, okay, over time after they had accessed the state facility. And in the end, they were reducing, uh, you know, dependencies on centralized systems, okay? So here you see it is benefiting the higher income groups and not the, the, you know, the poor social groups. Next slide, please. And one important thing here is that the, the new Ghanaian government, when it took over in 2007, 17, they revised the solar subsidy program and made it 100% fully covered by the state, but they directed it to uh, non-electrified locations in the eastern part of Ghana. And take note, the eastern part of Ghana is where Ghana's hydroelectric project, the main one, is located. And people think that they are more entitled to the grid than 
a solar, and there were previous promises by politicians to provide them with centralized grids. They saw at low voltage lines, surprisingly, when the, when the new government came to power, they gave them a solar, a solar that costs around 3,000 euros, sorry, around $3,000. They still saw that they, were, they felt being shortchanged and reduced to second class Ghanaian citizens. They needed a grid and they call it that. They said that solar is good, but we deserve the proper grid. Deserve there is an entitlement notion. And historically, Ghanaians have seen uh, that the grid really measures the level of modernity. It grants them the opportunity to, to run many modern appliances and they feel full, full citizens if they had a grade and they feel shortchange if they are given something below that. And that's very important here. If you check many grades in Ghana, they are run through the state apparatus or state institutions. So the benefits are almost like people depend on the grade. But regarding solar, people feel shortchanged. And this is very important, especially the very users are located in the eastern part of the country where the grid is where hydroelectricity is generated and they cannot understand why the high tension lines are running on top of their houses to the nearby you know, places and they don't get it. So this here, uh, one thing I want to draw attention to is that um, the more, there's more on uh, relative deprivation and, and more not so much of absolute deprivation. Please, can you uh, move uh, to, to the next slide? And then so here again, they, they, they think the grid, uh, the solar does not allow them to run um, uh, many appliances like refrigerators to store food and the rest. Please, next slide. Right, and here again, it doesn't allow them to, you know, to run micro enterprise and they think these are the reason they, they have a special preference for the grid. Next, please. And then when we come to Kenya, the same applies here. But the interesting thing is that many Kenyans have really accepted that once they are far away from the grid, they are fine. I'll come back to that shortly. So here, one requires about 5,000 uh, US dollars to put up such a facility with, uh, with uh, I mean, uh, solar water pumps. These are very expensive. This is a very, a very rich guy working in the Mombasa uh, you know, you know, hub, uh, port. And other lower income groups cannot afford this facility. Please go, go to the next slide. And then what I was trying to talk about is that when the Ghanaian government did this solar PV thing, people uh, in the cities thought that they deserved the grid, whereas people in the village thought that uh, which Ghanian, modern Ghanaian city doesn't have the grid. So now there's relative deprivation, not absolute deprivation. And this is very important that when we move to Kenya, it is completely different. So contest specificity are really crucial when designing such, uh, you know, such, uh, you know, decentralized systems. Please, next slide. Okay, but if you come to Kenya, when we see what we see on the right side here, it takes sometimes six to nine months or even more before you can access electrical grid facility, even after you've paid for the grid, you have to still give monies to middlemen and many people cannot go through this. So eventually they psych themselves and then they develop their practices around such decentralized systems. And they have accepted that in Kenya, solar is not for big men. So unlike Ghana, where such people have different, I mean, perception or they see it as being reduced to second class citizens, in many areas of Kenya, people have accepted that solar is fine with them, but not with Ghana. And these are state formation processes and how people have an, an understood the, I mean, or how people have attached certain values or meanings to decentralized and centralized groups in these different countries. Please go, go, go to the next slide. Okay, so many grid systems, I don't know if I have enough time to continue. These are new projects I'm doing uh, in Lesotho, uh, Ghana, Mozambique, uh, um, um, Namibia, but if I don't, I'm not too sure if I can go into this, but wherever I get to place, post me. Uh, so uh, mini grid, there are regulatory ambivalences. There are grid interconnection issues. The Kenya Power Lighting Company tells private sector actors to come in, but they can, they have, the, they reserve the right to encroach areas that are licensed to, uh, 
to, to private mini grid operators because the state doesn't want to let go of its cash cow. So here there are regulatory ambivalences and there's a case of a, a, a solar a, um, a mini grid operator called Power Hive operating in the Kizi County where in 2017, the Kenya Power uh, uh, encroached the areas, but it was still not ready to go for great interconnection as you know written down okay so we see this kind of politics you know really having consequences for uh, private sector investment their security and of course uniformity of tariffs in ghana where um the mini grids are really uh, are, are paying the same subsidized uh, as the grid it's also this it's also a disincentive to the private sector you know actors in ghana can you go to the next slide please? this is uh just Sorry to intervene here, but we are running short of time. If you could uh, possibly sort of wrap up in the next uh, right. minute. Okay, good, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, please, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so there are regulatory issues, as I mentioned, in Namibia, where we are also doing this project. Please go to the next slide. And then there are coordination issues. Some of the mini grid that are run by the state, those run by UNDP, and there, there are tensions. And of course, there are also no maintenance maintenance contract. So when the when, is, when the installations are done, nobody to take care and the systems are breaking down, and the rural people feel like a grid would have solved their problems. And here again, the, the, the system that are intended to address inequalities, the, the deepening feelings of neglect by the state. Please, next slide. Okay, the same thing, demand projections. When the, the systems are done, the sizing are just based on the current demands. And whenever the areas get opened up, the system are not able to take care of the new demand. And therefore, they, they have to do either load shedding, or if you see on the right side, the distributor have to now place restrictions on which appliances they can use or cannot use. And eventually, it does not allow the use of the mini grids for productive enterprise. I think I have to pause here because it will take me more time to explain the remaining slides. So I'll pause here and then when there's the question time, then I'll explain more. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Vestas. Um, it's very interesting to see how much local context matter in determining these uh, social impacts um, and, uh, you know, yeah. also ensuring that that the people who actually should be benefiting from some of these policies may not, may not be. Um, so, you know, overall, we have a lot to digest and process from the insights we've just heard. Um, and, uh, you know, this research is really important, not only for better understanding impacts to inform policy design, but also to help identify gaps in our understanding and to determine where, where future research should be focused. Um, so with that, we can now turn to, to a little bit of a panel discussion, um, even though we're a little bit short on time. Um, so we're currently at a pivotal moment in energy policy making spurred by policy reactions to COVID-19, um, but more recently the Russia-Ukraine energy crisis. So we really need to better understand the kind of full socioeconomic implications of, of clean energy policies. And so what we especially like to get out of this discussion is what areas of follow-on research are necessary or most valuable to better understand the interplay of social and economic factors and to support better policy design. Um, and we want to not only mitigate negative social impacts in clean energy policy design, but also to identify opportunities to proactively support progressive socioeconomic outcomes from, from clean energy policy. So with, with that in mind, um, I would just sort of pose a question to, to all of our panelists um, that in your research areas, you know, what do you see as the kind of largest gaps in, in the understanding? And therefore, what do you what do you see as the kind of next step to to sort of better understand this and to also sort of more systematically incorporate it into, into policy design? So I think we can just go in the order that we, we went through the presentation. So I'll turn it to Angela first. Thanks, Didia. And yeah, I'll be really quick on that. I think there is clearly a need now more than ever to understand what are the socioeconomic impacts of policies. I think there is a need to understand very much what is the impact not only of policies like subsidy on energy prices in the short term, but also how much um, risks are they creating on vulnerable 
consumers, for example, in the long term, because I think this is what we've seen, for example, with the uh, Ukraine crisis that you mentioned and the price crisis. We, we've we had decades of uh, fairly cheap, at least in the West or in the global North economic like uh, energy prices. And then all of a sudden we paid the price for that in terms of uh, risks and variability, which is what we've seen in the last year. And I think this is something that we'll need to understand more of. Uh, I think the other issue is understanding how to create more sustainable energy systems, not only through subsidies and price mechanisms, which is what we've kind of directed ourselves to uh, kind of as a default, but also in a broader uh, said, you know, trying to understand what many speakers touched on, what is the procedural fairness that you should ensure, what are the local issues that we don't necessarily understand, what are the regulatory problems that go beyond price mechanisms, and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so next we have uh, Anna. Uh, thank you for the question, Divya. Uh, I think that uh, there are several uh, um, uh, issues and barriers that we have to take into account. Uh, the first thing is that all policies need to be clearly address nearly need to clearly address uh, the financing issue. So it's nice uh, to um, propose a policy, but you have to back it up with clear financing. Another thing is to understand the real need of the vulnerable people or the people in general. So often policies are designed with a top-down uh, perspective. So scientists or politicians design this policy. It's a very nice one. They use statistical data, but we need to hear also the voices of those that are acting with their local within their local communities and understand what are the, their needs and how they can feel more involved in the energy transition. And the last thing uh, I think is uh, uh, something that we have to put uh, on the side of each subsidy or policy or whatever, is uh, to make people more aware of their energy consumption and their environmental impact and have a general energy education of the average person, not just those that uh, already have a con an environmental consciousness. Uh, because many, many people uh, don't understand why some policies are designed the way they are. And in order for them to apply those policies, to respect those policies, uh, uh, there is a gap to be filled that is uh, uh, greater environmental consciousness uh, uh, among uh, all the people and all the small steps everyone can take uh, to a brighter future, let's say. Great, uh, thanks Anna. And uh, Mariana, you're next. Yeah, I think that besides of energy security and energy transition, it's important also to understand who are the vulnerable groups and try to address the energy efficient programs to those groups in order to make sure that people want to have access to energy service with a, like in a low level like in an efficient way, and also to provide uh, social uh, tariffs programs in order to reduce the cost of this consumption for vulnerable groups. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Kate, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would echo what Anna said about really incorporating communities in these decision making and policy processes. Um, I think, you know, that is it's not an easy task, um, but I think it's really, really important to to effective policies in the long run. Um, and then I would say also like looking at our existing programs and incentive programs and thinking about, you know, how we can redistribute some of that money to really focus on the most vulnerable populations. I think it makes a lot of sense in the beginning when technologies are just emerging um, to, you know, focus th those policies on those early adopters. But I think we've reached a point with many of our technologies that it is time to transition those to, to the most vulnerable populations. Okay, great. Um, and Festus, back to you. Uh, Festus, are you still with us? Yeah, hello. Uh, hi, if you have some concluding thoughts. Right. Um, yeah, I think that um, 
there's one more thing that I couldn't uh, shed light on, and I uh, just thought that issue of tariffing um, is something that um, maybe is certainly a crucial aspect of the of the social components of energy policies. Um, I wanted to talk about that, but maybe later I will share works on that. Um, I'll be giving my habilitation, habilitation uh, public lecture next month. Hopefully, uh, you can, maybe you can join soon. But the key point here is that the tariff structures have been a big issue. Uh, you see, the design of the tariffs are not really done in a very just way because people have different uh, income levels. People in the periphery who are the being the targets of of electrification don't have the same income level. Surprisingly. Many across Africa, they, they use um, the, the centralized grid tariffs for off-grid locations, and that has been a big issue across Africa. And it's the same thing that there's limited protective space for uh, standalone options. They are left at the mercy of the solar PV providers. So a lot of people have become, you know, target for exploitation. And this is one of the issues that I'm thinking of going forward in the design of the, the social aspects of, 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 of you know, uh, renewable energy technologies, much, much attention should be focused on. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And I do apologize that we didn't have time to get into, into all the details, but um, hopefully this is just a starting point and I would encourage all the participants to, to check out the event page, which will have everyone's presentations, but also to, to follow the, the sort of research um, areas for all the all the speakers and uh, follow up with them directly. But with that, I will hand the floor back to Berta to offer some concluding remarks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Putting people in the center of the energy system is fundamental to a ju just transition and also a precondition for its success. So I think this webinar has provided a very important perspective on, uh, on the topic. Let me highlight three observations. Um, context and time matters, policies matter and can mitigate a negative social outcome. So what may have a positive social income in one context may not work in another one. That goes for uh, economies, but it goes also for locations, whether being in cities or in remote areas. So different impact. Uh, for similar policies. Process and consultations are key, but it takes time to build uh, engagement for an equitable implementation. Uh, and then also there's need for systematic assessment of the long-term social and climate impact of policies. And my second uh, topic is that uh, it is complicated and we need more knowledge and tools to explore the social impact and climate impacts of policies um, before we can expect policymakers uh, to design socially effective clean energy policies. So governments have to learn to design better policies that combine uh, the social uh, aspect with the climate reduction. And tools can make a difference. I find uh, the residential sector electrogenic insects very, very interesting and seems to be a powerful tool. The energy poverty health nexus is also very important and uh, it's difficult then to uh, design uh, energy efficient policies that address this complex nex nexus. This also goes for uh, the decentralized uh, energy system in African countries with a lot of uh, demand and supply uh, dilemmas. And then finally, international collaboration matters, not least when it comes to exchange best practices. And an observation which I will pass on to uh, third is that um, it's important that the technology cooperation programs actually uh, engage in this uh, topic and there's a lot of the uh, issues that is relevant for the individual technologies um, 
So I'm also very pleased to be invited by the Hydrogen TCP to present the findings of this uh, workshop at the coming EXCO meeting uh, end of June. And I really hope that other TCPs also will engage in this important issue. So thank you very much to all of the presenters. Thank you to the participants from around the world. And thank you for a wonderful moderation, Eva. So goodbye from Denmark and have a nice day.